You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. So here you've got this gold-bearing shear zone in a tier one jurisdiction with a very supportive New Finland government and Canadian government wanting uh, uh, more exploration, more mine development on the island. And a company sitting on what I think, as a cliche goes, a gold mine. It's just, it is 120 strike kilometers, which has never been tested, except in one area where they've got 840,000 ounces. So for me, it was, wow, this is fantastic. Let's build up another team here at DRD Gold. That was a t- over a 10 bagger when I was running that company. Gold Road went from five cents to a dollar ninety for shareholders. And I see at Matador, we can do exactly the same thing here. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, and I am excited to bring to you a new profile interview today with Matador Mining. Now, I was introduced to its executive chairman, Ian Murray, who joins me today about a month ago when we had a call. And I was excited uh, about that call, not just to learn about Matador Mining, but to be introduced to Ian. Because two years ago, as many of the longtime listeners will know, we began to profile Ocino resources before they hit their discovery hole. I also was an investor at 30 cents before the stock has run up to uh, buck 60, buck 65 at its peak. And when I was talking to Hayadon, the CEO, before they had their, their discovery hole, I said, give me an analog. You know, I'm not a geologist. I'm a mining speculator. What can I look to for your success? And he said, well, Bill, I want to point you to Gold Road Resources. This was a gold discovery undercover in Australia. And in one year, they took it from discovery hole to resource, about 3.5 million ounces, all undercover. Haya said, we're exploring undercover. This would be the pattern. And then Gold Road took it from discovery hole to literally production in about five and a half years, which in this industry is lightning speed. Market cap went from Australian 8 million to 1.5 billion, I believe at its peak. And it's over a billion dollars as we speak today. Well, the person at the helm of Gold Road Resources that oversaw all that value creation is Ian Murray. He's now the executive chairman of Matador Mining, which we're going to feature today. So Ian, welcome to the show. As I kind of gave uh, the background of how I got to know you through investing in Osino Resources and Osino pointing to your prior success, could you elaborate a little more on your success that you had with uh, Gold Road Resources and your previous success in the industry? No, thank you, Bill. Yeah, no, Gold Road was a great story. And the most important thing is have fun. So in Gold Road, um, we built up a very good exploration team. We owned an untested green, greenstone belt in Western Australia. Um, it's 1,200 kilometers from Perth, where, we're, where I'm based, or that's probably 800 miles from, from Perth. So it's not close to the city, it's far away. And we knew that we had to discover a big enough deposit to build a new mine. You can't have a small 200,000 ounce deposit, you're never going to, be, going to be able to develop it. You needed to have 10 year plus mine life and over 100,000 ounces of gold. And I challenged the geologists, there was already a million ounces in resource, but I challenged the geologists. I said, how do you know what you've discovered is the best system? I know you found the easiest system to find, but you haven't found the best system. And then they went off, they did the targeting across this massive uh, greenstone belt, came up with the targets, uh, we then got the money, funded it. They went out and explored, and then they discovered Gruyere. And as you're right, we discovered it. I remember um, September uh, 2012. We had the maiden resource by July 2013. 3.5 million ounces. It's now over 7 million ounce resource. 15 year mine life and generating very lowest quartile operating costs, um, uh, generating significant cash flow. But that was my second foray in the gold mining space. I started in South Africa with a company called DRD Gold, which is listed on the NYSE. I was chief financial officer there, and then I became managing director. And that company had 90% of its shareholders in the US trading through the ADR program, and we traded 500% of, of our issued capital per year. And that's a company that had old mines in South Africa, but we ran them very effectively made good money for shareholders, and that share price was a 10-bagger in South Africa with, uh, through, through uh, 
the ADR program. <clears throat> I, I left South Africa, moved to Australia, got involved in Gold Road, built up a very good team of geologists to do the work. We found an amazing project called Gruyere, built that mine, and then I decided to retire at the end of 2018 and focus on non-executive roles. So I want to focus on two things here. Um, your experience with American investors, obviously with DRD, you've uh, had experience with American investors. Matador Mining is a Australian company with its flagship project in Newfoundland in Canada, but now you've just listed on the, the OTCQX to reach American investors. Uh, the ticker symbol I should note is MZZMF. The website is matadormining.com. Dot AU. So I want you to talk uh, to my American audience, of course, but also talk about why did you come out of retirement to take on the helm of uh, Matador Mining? What, what did you see with your experience? You didn't need to do it, but why did you step back into this role? I'll first start with the, the US shareholder base. So, so in South Africa with, the, with DRD, I used to get across to the US once a quarter, do the road shows, attend those those gold, the trade shows down in New Orleans, New York, um, San Francisco. And I really enjoyed speaking to the, to, uh, with, with the US, US investors. They were incredibly passionate. And that was the time when gold was hit $254 an ounce. It was the dark days, but the, the investors were there, were there. They had faith that gold could go a lot higher, and it has. Um, and it was just I really enjoyed speaking to speaking to those investors and hearing their passion and why they were diversifying away from the US dollar into into the gold industry, gold, physical gold and gold stocks. So the reason I came out of retirement, I was asked to look at this company called Matador Mining with a project in New Finland, which I'd never looked at before because in Australia, as an Australian, there's so many Australian gold companies with projects in Australia. But I had one look at what Matador had, which is 120 strike kilometers of an untested shear zone. At the northern end of that shear zone, Marathon Gold has got 4.8 million ounces. At the southern end, Matador's already got 840,000 ounces. There's over 100 kilometers between, between those two discoveries with no exploration. In fact, over 100 kilometer strike length, there are less than 20 drill holes ever been drilled into this area. So in Australia or any of the known gold districts in, in North America, you'd have thousands of drill holes in that over that strike extent. So to me, this was going back to gold road resources, what I saw there, and the million ounces, but had they found the best system? And that's a question I had for the geologists with, with in Matador. Yes, we've got 840,000 ounces, but is this the best deposit on that belt? The 840,000 ounces is where the mineralization outcrops at surface. So the original explorers there found gold at surface and kept following it down. 90% of the tenement is covered in transported material, a shallow till, transported till, between half a meter to five meters. So it's not, it's not very thick from an exploration perspective, but it is thick enough that no work's ever been done under it. So here you've got this gold bearing shear zone in a tier one jurisdiction with a very supportive New Finland government and Canadian government wanting uh, uh, more exploration, more mine development on the island and a company sitting on what I think as a cliche goes, a gold mine. It's just, it is 120 strike kilometers, which has never been tested except in one area where they've got 840,000 ounces. So for me, it was, wow, this is fantastic. Let's build up another team here at DRD Gold. That was a t over a 10 bagger when I was running that company. Gold Road went from five cents to a dollar 90 for shareholders. And I see at Matador, we can do exactly the same thing here. Be smart with the exploration, make the big discoveries, build up the critical mass, and then look at converting that into production and into cash flow for shareholders. I think you have a good uh, balance of fundamental value with the deposit that you've already outlined. But as you say, you have this extreme exploration potential that you and your team sees. Talk about the deposit. The, the Cape Ray Gold Project is your flagship. This is at the scoping study level. And for my North American listeners, we refer to it as a PEA or preliminary economic assessment. Uh, go over the highlights here before we talk about your exploration program. 
Yeah, Bill, so that the 840,000 ounces is in three main areas. Those three areas are within 10 miles of each other. So 10 miles north to south, you've got these three areas that host that resource. The main one is Central Zone with over 500,000 ounces of gold, Window Glass Hill with 230,000 ounces of gold, and Isle of Mort at 60,000 ounces of gold. So the PEA that we published in May of last year, 2020, that looked at simple open pit mining of these deposits. Um, when we're talking uh, gold mineralization, the average depth is about 120 meters below surface. So these are simple open pitable deposits trucked in within that 10 mile area to a central processing plant. The process plant is, is stock standard gold mining technology. So CI, uh, crush grind, chemical recovery, CIL recovery, and gravity recovery, giving us 96% recovery of the gold in the rock. Um, of the 840,000 ounces, 480,000 ounces is the mineable component of it. Um, it's a seven year mine life. The first four years are particularly good. We average, the average grade mine is 2.6 gram per ton, but bear in mind, this is open pit. So 2.6 gram per ton, this would be one of the highest open pit uh, mines in the world that has not yet been developed. So 2.6 gram per ton for the first four years, 88,000 ounces of gold per year. Average AISE, uh, all in sustaining costs per ounce produced in the life of mine is under 800 US dollars an ounce. So very low operating cost. The NPV of that project is in Australian dollars, $245 million uh, compared to capital spend of 145 million Australian dollars. So in US dollars, you're talking roughly probably 180 US NPV relative to 100 um, CapEx. And the, I mentioned those two numbers because in all the projects I've studied and then developed, a key ratio is what is the NPV compared to your capital spend? And you want that to be over 1.2, a factor of 1.2. And here we're talking a factor of 1.8. And it's only at scoping studies, study stage, and it's only a seven-year mine life. Other key number to bear in mind when you're looking at developing a mine is what is the payback period relative to the life of mine? And the payback period, because of that good grade in the first four years, is just over one year relative to a seven-year mine life. So you'll pay off the capital quickly, and then the rest of that cash flow goes to shareholders. So from a scoping study perspective, what I learned a long time ago in the industry is the only two outcomes of a scoping study that you focus on. Technically, are there any roadblocks that'll stop you developing this project? And no, they are not. The met recoveries, metallurgical recoveries are very, very good. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, ground in the uh, space in the area uh, where these deposits are to build the infrastructure. The project is only 25 kilometers or 15 miles away from uh, a major town called Port of Basque, which is also a port. So to, build, to bring in all the materials we need to build the project, we can bring it into that port and we only need to truck it 25 kilometers. It's not like when we built the Gruyere project in Australia and we had to transport the material uh, 1,200 kilometers or uh, was it 800, 800 miles to, to build a project. This is 25 kilometers or 15, 15 miles. So it's very close, easy to build. So technically there are no roadblocks to stop us going ahead. And the second key point is economically. And as I mentioned, NPV to CapEx ratio is very, very strong. Payback to life of mine is very, very strong. So the next question is, well, why don't we go ahead and develop it? And the reason for that is, as I showed with Gruyer, we may not have found the best deposits there. I want to, as long as we're drilling and growing the resources, let's do that before we press the button for the pre-feasibility study. All the study work is going on in parallel with our exploration activity, but our aim is to grow the resources so we do have more, better, longer than a 10-year mine life and longer than or more than 100,000 ounces per year of production. And those two numbers are key to me because at a project longer than 10 years, you'll get very good, especially for a Canadian project, very good low-cost debt, which leads to low-cost equity, so good returns for shareholders. And the second reason is at 100,000 ounces per year, with those operating costs of less than 800 US ARSC cost per ounce, you'll generate very strong EBITDAs or cash flows, 
which can go to pay back the debt, further expiration on this untested belt, and thirdly, dividends for shareholders. So yeah, the scoping study of PEA was great, but we all believe we can continue to grow that into something that is really substantial. And you're looking to grow it with a unique exploration method. This is what I want to get into. You were successful with this with Gold Road, Osino patterned their exploration undercover. You mentioned you have 120 kilometers of strike on the shear zone and 90% is under till. So it's it's uh, it's un, untested in a sense, but you're uh, employing this new method. Walk us through this new method and why we should uh, expect better results with it. Well, the first thing I'll say is it's not a new method. It's what all the Australian explorers use in in Australia. New method to we, Canada, perhaps? <laughs> in Australia, we explore under 50 metres of cover, 100 metres of cover, 200 metres of cover. And this is the way we do it because there are two options. Either you go and you pepper the area with lots and lots of diamond holes, which is pretty much throwing lots of darts at the dartboard, or you make the bullseye in the dartboard a lot bigger by doing your uh, first pass testing. So what we've proved in 2020 is that magnetic surveys show the right structures underground very, very clearly. Um, so previously we've relied on the government provided aeromagnetic surveys, which are based on 200 meter spaced lines. Um, and that gives you very vague images, but it was good enough for us to discover uh, the Angus discovery in 2020, which is the first discovery in 20 years on the belt by a company that's only been exploring for the last two years. So great outcome for our team. But we proved that magnetic. So the guys walked on the ground with, with magnetic backpacks, 30 meters placed lines, and we got very clear images of the structures in the area where Angus was discovered. So that's proved that magnetics gives us the clear structures. To accelerate how quickly we get the magnetic data, we're flying magnetic surveys. So we're using helicopters. Those helicopters will fly 30 meter spaced lines and 30 meters above the ground. What's that, 100 foot lines and 100, foot, 100 feet above the ground. They will do that over 45 strike kilometers, 30 miles of of the belt first. So we're doing two phases of aeromag, the first 30 miles and then the second 30 miles, close space, and that'll give us clear images of the structures uh, at, uh, at depth. Once you've got the targets identified from, from that, we then go in with what's called a power auger. So it's cheap, it's quick. So it's a, a, a drill rig built on the back of an ATV, all-terrain vehicle, a track-mounted ATV, they can go through the swampy areas. It can go through the over the snow. It can get to all the remote areas. So we identify targets through the magnetic uh, images. We then test through the transported material with this power auger. So we drill down and we take a sample of the transported material. Once we get to the through the transported material and we're at the top of the fresh material, we change the drill bit to a diamond drill bit and we get a 20 centimeter sample of the top of the fresh um, rock as a diamond sample. Both of those are sent away for multi-element assays. We test for 47 different elements, including gold, but all the pathfinder elements that we know show us that are normally associated with gold mineralization. So through this testing with the auger rig, we don't have to hit gold. All we have to hit with it of the pathfinder elements that we know from testing on the rest of our belt, where we have the rest of our resources, these, these minerals are associated. So that's molybdenum, zinc, arsenic, uh, copper, et cetera. Um, so where we, find, where we draw with a, with a power auger and we get these uh, pathfinder elements, we know we're close to gold, we refine the targeting, and then we only put the expensive diamond drilling in when we've made that bullseye a lot bigger for us. So the dart is going to hit the bullseye. It's not going to hit all the other numbers around the bullseye, but we know we've got a bigger target to hit. So that's the strategy for our exploration in 2021. We're doing what we did in 2020, but we're doing it on a much bigger scale than what we did in, in 2020. 
And one of the ways it differs from other explorers, if I understand this correctly, is that you're looking to do more shallow holes rather than spend money on deep holes. So you could potentially outline more ounces because what you found thus far has been relatively close to surface. Yeah, well, if you think of, of, of diamond drilling, um, diamond drill drills down 100 meters to 200 meters, you might get 50 to 60 meters per shift. With the power auger, we'll get 10 drill holes a day. So whereas a diamond drill hole would take you four days to do, we would get 40 of the power auger drill, drills, drill holes. Um, so we're testing a much bigger footprint quicker with the cheaper drilling method as well. When it comes to the diamond drilling, and you raise a good point there about the number of holes, um, a lot of explorers in Canada are looking for deposits five, six, seven hundred meters below surface. We're drilling down to 100 meters, down to 150 meters. So when we say, as we announced, uh, when we started our program, we're going to do in excess of 20,000 meters of drilling. If our average drill hole is 100 meters, that's 20, sorry, that's 200 separate diamond holes on top of all the power auger holes we're doing. So it's the most cost-effective way for us to explore for shareholders. And the most important thing for us is shareholder money. That it's hard to raise money from the market and we don't want to waste any of it. And that is why we've come up with these cost-effective approaches, which proved their success in 2020 and have proved their success in Australia over the last few decades. And let's talk uh, your valuation relative to some of your peers in Newfoundland. There's explorers, as you know, with some very impressive results that are over a billion dollars U.S. market cap with no proven resource. There's other explorers that have an 80 million U.S. market cap with no resource. Uh, you have a resource. You have a scoping study. You have the exploration upside you just outlined. Uh, what is your valuation relative to your peers? Our market cap is around, in US dollars, around $50 million. Uh, when we look at our peers on the island, let's start at the top. You've got Newfound Gold, which is listing on the NYSE at some stage. Market cap of $1.2 billion with no resources yet. Yes, they're getting very high-grade intercepts, but we control an entire uh, shear zone, 120 strike kilometers, untested, we know there's 4.8 million ounces at the north. We know there's 840,000 ounces in the south, and we're going to test what's in between those two now. So you've got newfound gold at 1.2 billion. You've then got Marathon Gold, with, who've got the 4.8 million ounce project. Their market cap is around $600 million. They're in feasibility stage. Sorry, they've just published feasibility, and they're starting their early works program to get ready for construction. So they'll, they'll be building their project for the next two years. Then you've got the other explorers on the island, uh, Maritime Resources, Labrador, and they're worth around 80 to $100 million, but much smaller exploration programs than ours and much smaller tenement than ours and no current resources. So you're right. We've got the 840,000 ounces. We've done the PEA. We've shown that that's very, very economic. But to me, I get really excited about what we haven't tested yet. That's where we're going to come with the big step change discoveries that will move us up in, in value significantly. If we compare ourselves to the Australian companies that operate in Canada, they're trading at between $150 and $200 million, and we $50 million. So there's a huge valuation gap, and that just comes down to education of the Australian investors. But also, we've gone for the OTC listing so that we are trading in the same time zone as our project and we're trading in the same time zone as our Canadian peers are, are trading. So investors in the US can do the direct comparison to these other companies, see how cheap we are, and then invest in us in your time zones. Uh, let's talk treasury and burn rate. What's in the treasury and how fast are you going through it? Uh, in treasury, we've got $8 million at the end of March. Australian dollars, uh, to clarify. Australian dollars, so that's $3 million. Sorry, um, five or six million US dollars. We had the same number in December, which some investors may say, well, how do you have the same number? And that's because we've got a number of well in the money options, which expire in July 2021. Um, sorry, 2022. Uh, those options are being exercised all the time. 
Uh, and when the people ex exercise those options, money comes into our treasury. So there's a further $5 million that'll be exercised over the next 14 months that'll come in and add to our $8 million. So we've got $8 million now, but the way I look at the budget is we've got access to, to $13 million Australian. Our current burn rate is around a million dollars a month. So this money will help, will fund this exploration program all the way through um, to very late in the year. And at some stage, as all exploration companies, we will raise money, but we don't need to rush out and raise money now. We did it in Gold Road successfully. You get good exploration news. You get uh, new investors wanting to come in. You have the share price moving up, and then you can raise, raise further capital. The other thing I would, I would highlight for the North American investors is the, when we raised money in July last year, we raised it through the Canadian charity flow-through model. So when we raise money, we raise it at a 45% premium to what the normal market price is. So it's less dilutionary for our existing shareholders. And it's a, it's a great model in which the Australian government would adopt it. Canada's got it. It's a fantastic model for the exploration companies and for the charities. So we've got the cash. We're kicking off the program. We've got more cash coming in from the exercise of the options and we will have significant news flow through the big program that we're already rolling out. And Ian, as we wrap it up, could you just uh, go review for us what news flow should we expect the rest of this year? Because we've kicked off expiration already, there'll be news flow coming through from the power auger drilling. There'll be news flow coming through from the heli mag surveys as they progress. But most importantly, there'll be news flow coming from the plus 20,000 meters of diamond drilling that we're doing. Um, on top of that, uh, I mentioned that we're doing all the study work in the background, so further metallurgical test work, uh, further uh, work to environmental test work that we're doing, all to prepare us so that when we press the button on the pre-feasibility study, when the resource is big enough, all that work's been done. Um, so significant news flow because we're so active with all the work that we're doing. Uh, we'll be highlighting new targets that get identified from the AeroMag and the Power Auger, and we'll be announcing uh, drill results from the diamond core drilling that we do with, with uh, um, the diamond rig. So lots of news. So probably every, every two weeks, there'll be another announcement out for the market. The company is Matador Mining. Ticker symbol in the States is M-Z-Z-M-F. Website is matadormining.com. Dot AU. Make sure you put that dot .au for Australia after the dot .com uh, to learn more. I'll also link to the presentation in the show notes. Ian, really appreciated uh, getting to know you. Uh, it's been a pleasure and thank you for coming on my show to provide a profile. Thank you, Bill. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to getting across to both the US and Canada in the second half of this year. 